And if all is good, we are live today. Um, well, we are live today. We were live yesterday. We were live on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. But today it is something special because today I have two special people with me who know a lot about phototherapy, who have known Dr. Brian McLaren really well. Sadly, I was expecting a third person. Maybe he's still going to come on. Uh, if so, I will surely make sure for him to get in here. But meanwhile, I need to click on one little button to make sure that this is also recorded. So you never know if something goes wrong on Facebook, at least we will have it um, on, uh, in the cloud too. So today I am going to talk to Trevor Woosencroft, sorry, Trevor Woosencroft, who you already saw in the live interview number two. That was in July, okay? And we will also have Dr. Terry Woods with us here. Don't look at the name underneath. It's just the inter to get into Zoom. He went through the account of his wife, but that's all fine. As long as you're here, we're happy. But this is Dr. Terry Wood. So first of all, let me present to you Trevor Woosencroft. Trevor, as you may remember, is a happily married man of over 55 years. For me, that's a record. I will never be able to do that because... At 52, I'm still not married. Um, and I should not be saying all that. But anyways, 50, 55 years of marriage. He has, uh, he's the father of two kids. He is a passionate horseman and cattleman. And he has been using photonic therapy. Uh, if I remember well, he has known Dr. Brian McLaren since 1993. So I'm going to start with Trevor to talk about this, but he has known Dr. McLaren for so many years and about photonic therapy, it's the same time. But let me first present to you also Dr. Terry Wood. He is also a passionate uh, um, veterinarian who is happily married and who is also the father of two. In this case, it's two boys with Trevor. It's one boy and one girl. Now, Dr. Terry Wood has known Dr. Brian McLaren since Dr. Brian McLaren went to the States. And that's also the topic of today. Namely, we are going to talk mainly about the time frame of 1999 till 2009. So 1999, just before Dr. Brian McLaren left for the United States, he came back, I think it was around 2003, 2004. Uh, but we were going to start with Trevor. And later on, uh, I will continue with Dr. Terry, who has allowed me to call him Dr. Terry. Um, okay, now Trevor, you have been telling me that you met Dr. Brian McLaren in 1993. Can you just help us up? Uh, on the road to say again and, and repeat because we talked about that at, uh, in interview number two. Could you just let us know how you met Dr. Brian McLaren and how it went on then? Well, I, I met Brian in the, in uh, '93 in in uh, August '93, and uh, the company I was working with, we were in Southern Australia, uh, a big limousine cattle stud, was the biggest limousine cattle stud in Australia at, um, at that time. Uh, and we moved to Queensland uh, and formed a partnership with another uh, gentleman up here that uh, had probably not, and both properties weren't very far from where Brian was the, uh, the local vet. And, uh, and of course, trying to work my eye around because, uh, you know, I've worked, up to now, I've worked and been associated with over, over 60 vets in my lifetime. And, uh, and un unfortunately, uh, Nothing against you, Terry, but I've, I've had, to, I have. There's a lot of vets, and I just don't get on. Uh, and uh, and I was, I, uh, and while I was there, I was, met one of the neighbours, and I said to him, uh, "Well, the first thing I've got to do is get myself a good vet because we were into embryo transplant, all this sort of thing." And I said, "I've got to get a good vet." And this is something that people seem to forget about. They kept, they move to a property or move to a different area, and. Uh, and the, the first thing everybody should do if they've got animals is is uh, sort out a, a local vet that you know that they uh, that they can get on with or knows what they want to do. Because I'm very fortunate where I live. I'm in the middle of at the moment. I'm in the middle of a, a country that breeds a lot of horses. Uh, we got some big horse studs around here. So fortunately, we have at least 
uh, 12, 15 vets in their area. So nobody can complain and say they don't have anybody to, to do the job. But uh, uh, but when I, in talking to this fellow, I said to him about, uh, did I need one? And he said, oh, he said, well, there's one fellow in Alloroy, which is their local town. He says, oh, you wouldn't want anything to do with him. He said, he he bit of a voodoo thing. He said, he's got some laser light or something or other. He, he said that... Uh, Oh, he said, oh, you know, he said, oh, I'd keep away from that. And I says, well, the first thing is that's the person I need to meet because we need to, in this day and age, we need to look outside the square. And I say, well, well, well my education goes back to the, uh, to the uh, uh, late 1940s and the early, early 50s. Uh, I know I was very young now. I was always interested in this sort of thing. And, uh, and I know We've progressed so far, and uh, but you do have to have, if you're going to have animals, it doesn't matter whether you've got dogs, cats, or what, you need to know the local vets. So this is uh, how we started off with Brian, and uh, at that time, of course, he was only just uh, on this journey that he uh, with the photonic therapy, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I was also the people that make the torches and still make them today. Uh, very good friends of ours and, and uh, so sort of they were in between Brian and us uh, from town so uh, it was a very uh, it was a very interesting time for me to come in because I'm a great believer in seeing what else is out there and being an ex-farmer uh, you you cannot afford to have your neighbours doing things and you don't know what's going on so I, I'm always looking at these things although they you, you might need them today but uh, you never do know when you need things coming up and or need to know where to go so that was my my introduction to uh, uh to to uh, brian uh, when i first come to uh, back i come from queensland originally but that's when i came back in in 93 in, in august okay and uh if i understood it well brian was then having human clinics in alora and you started to go there for yourself Correct. Yes, well, that that's correct. But the very first treatment that Brian gave me before he started his clinics, okay, uh, one day that uh, uh, I had uh, bulls to go to stud bulls to go to a cattle sale on the Monday to a big sale, and of course Sunday, me and well, I'm I'm another gunner going to get around to it, and I hadn't got on to Brian to get him to come out to do the health certificates, so I rang him on the Saturday night. Uh, very sheepishly and ask him if he'd got any chance of coming out tomorrow to give me this search. <laughs> Imagine what he said to me to start with. But anyway, because it was Sunday, he says, oh, do you need anything else? So uh, I called out to my wife. She says, well, oh, well, tell him, Ryan, we can we can do some bread and milk. So, uh, And I said, well, you better put in the Sunday papers for me too. God, he says, you're farmers. You can imagine. He, yeah. he, he gave me a bit of a hard time. But anyway, when he came out, uh, in those days, I was able to jump fences and gates, and uh, and I landed on the wrong foot, and I was hit going around with a big swollen ankle. And he says, "What nurse wrong with you?" And I said, "Oh well, I sprained my ankle." Oh, he says, "We hadn't even looked at the cattle. We hadn't what he was there for." So we we sit down the, on a, a an old milking stool was by the shed, and the, and he treated started treating my ankle. And I said, "Oh, I said that's funny." I says, "Feels like it's coming at my other ankle." And uh, and he says, well, I hope it is because it's working. So that's my introduction to him actually treating me. And uh, and as time went on, you know, naturally uh, he uh, he had to stop. At that time, he was still treating cattle, uh, a fair bit and horses. And then he uh, he had so much work, people wanting him. I, we look in in back of his house. I've seen ostriches with displayed legs, and you've got no idea some of the things that people used to turn up with. And the, and uh, I'd say, well, how on earth are you going to fix that? And he says, well, he says, uh, it's one of those things nobody knows and neither do I. So anyway, he, it was amazing how many things he did fix. And uh, so uh, it finished up that he was, the, only myself and, and another fellow that he was going to as far as veterinary stuff goes, and then he opened his clinics. And he had that many people there. It was, it was not funny. Uh, the amount of people that were coming, there was so many problems. So uh, I would go in there, you know, like probably a couple of times, a, well, a couple of times a week for for uh, for two or three weeks, and and then he got back to about twice a month until he went went to Brisbane. But uh, 
it was certainly made one hell of a difference to me. I, I, mean, I wouldn't be walking today, I don't think, if I'd never had my torch. That There isn't any doubt about it whatsoever. And I've got very, very bad eyes, but not glaucoma, but the high blood uh, high pressure they get. But I just use the torch around my eyes. As long as I, I do it about once a three weeks or once a fortnight. But we do have a lady uh, in Warwick, when Brian was first developing this therapy, uh, that she was so bad with... Um, uh, glaucoma, she couldn't, yeah, she just couldn't even get the car. She couldn't go anywhere because there's nothing they could do about it. And uh, because she would had a, apparently, um, uh, any medication, she had, she had bad reactions to it. So anyway, Brian started her on, on this trial and, uh, and, and she's living a very normal life, uh, because, uh, you, you know, the light brings the pressure down, but she has to treat herself every two days. Uh, with me is different. You know, mine was still gets nearly as high, but uh, but she's in a bad way. And uh, I said to her one day when she she rang me about getting the torch repaired. I said, "Well, how are you going?" She says, "Oh, well, still the same, still going right." She says, "I know it hasn't fixed me, but we we accept that." But uh, she said, "I still have to treat myself every two days because otherwise it feels like my head's going to blow off." Mm-hmm. So uh, he he did. You know, like, uh, and it was a bit. It was a bit disappointing when he left for Brisbane because uh, uh, Brisbane is, you know, is a couple of hours away from me. And now we have got just bad fires. Their roads are cut, so he's about, it's about three and a half hours away from me. Mm-hmm. But uh, but in that area, uh, you know, like he was, and this one farm is going. That I know that the child had trouble with uh, wetting the bed, and all these things were going on. So he was treating the whole family. Just wasn't treating. He'd mm-hmm. treat the cattle and then he'd finish up treating the whole family. And he said, well, some of the, the you know, things he needed to do, he, he'd finish up two hours late because, oh, well, can you do this and can you do that? Mm-hmm. That's how everything kept going on. But unfortunately, not enough people, uh, you know, it was still, it's still that. I, I think it's like everything else because it's, uh, it's not the cost of it, but it's, uh, you know, the dearer it is, everybody seems to think it's, it's better anyway. Yeah. And, and really for what we can do is very cheap. Yeah. And what did you think when Brian decided to leave for the United States? Well, actually he was gone and I, I didn't know he had actually gone because he was in Brisbane and, and we'd lost a, a fair bit of touch at the time. Uh, and, and, and how I knew was the, the where the people that made the torches, these friends of his, at, uh, uh, said to me one day, how many torches are going over to America? And which, I mean, they say, oh, nearly gobsmacked. You know, the amount that were going out, hundreds a month going over there. And uh, and it was it was a bit disappointing, but at the same time, he needed to do that. He needed to, to get over there to get the whole thing going. And and I know even with my workshops, uh, you know, if when O'Brien came back and, and we'd start them up, uh, because it was Brian, you you actually had you had that much more. Uh, like people were looking at that that you know to come to them at very you know like a lot more so. Uh, but uh, he needed to go where he go, and it was just unfortunate. Uh, e- even now that uh, we, we don't have him here, but he the amount of things that I used to have that I was able to ring him up. But there again, that was another unfortunate thing because we'd, I'd ring him up and ask him about something, and about an hour later. We'd gone through so many other things. I forgot what he told me in the first place. So let's start again. Yeah. Uh, but but he was very very generous, exceptionally generous. Uh, and it was <laughs> I, I know I'm known as Trevor Have a Chat, but I think he was he could outdo me as well. But, uh, <laughs> okay. He, he, but he was very 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 good. So yeah. it was it it was disappointing, but it was that life goes on. Yeah. And can you tell us something more about the first time you used the red light on a horse? I think you <laughs> yes. had a story about that. Yes, well, that that it was very very interesting because uh, it was uh, when uh, like uh, when we the, the property that a company had we sold because I I'd, I'd had a you know like had enough of what we were doing and uh, we would my wife and I. Uh, uh, took on a uh, uh, well a commission business going throughout uh, Eastern Australia because we could, we're a bit like Darby and Joan. We had a 42 foot truck and trailer, and we used to sell 
uh, cattle gear and sheep gear and all these sorts of things. And we had a lot of pneumatics. All the new stuff was coming to the market. And we go through as far as Western Australia. So it means we do, you know, something like the time we got back home, we're getting done to 10,000 K. And uh, the thing is, uh, these friends of ours said to me about, uh, I know this might be just the subject, but this is how it all come in, uh, that uh, about Brian and, and what he was doing. So they said, well, because I'm going to all these field days, I could possibly look at, you know, like if they were interested. So uh, I, uh, I contacted Brian and he says, oh, fine. He says, I'll talk to Louise, which which, which is his daughter that was running the company at that time. And I saw her at one of the field days we had, and that's how we actually started, actually uh, yeah, like actually selling it. And I mean, I spent many, 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 many hours on going through all the videos, going backwards and forwards and uh, worrying like Billy O that I was putting it in the right, wrong place, the right place or the wrong place. Uh, and uh, we're, we're no different now. But but this particular horse that I started on when I first got my torch back, uh, when I first started, was that he was on a property, uh, a thoroughbred property, which I was at the time was renting a, a house on. And I knew when he was going about, there was a major, major problem, uh, you know, with this particular horse. He, uh, uh, you could see he was jarring up all the time, uh, just a stock horse, working cattle. He was jarring up uh, and he had to have tendon problems. You know, there wasn't too much doubt about whatsoever. So anyway, um, uh, I spoke to the owners and, uh, and they said, oh, yeah, but they really didn't want to know anything about it. So if I can have a look at him. And anyway, so I, uh, when he was in the yard one afternoon, I went over and had a look at him. But my wife and I took us 15 minutes to catch him in a small yard and uh, eventually got him. And look, he could not bear me touching his tendons. He was, uh, it, it was, I felt terrible he was actually doing it. Anyway, he took me a while to get the light on him. Uh, but I just, I didn't even do his general points. I thought, well, the poor devil, he's, you know, like he's, he probably isn't wondering what that's going on. So anyway, I just treated his tendons uh, from his knees down to his hock and uh, to his fetlock, sorry. And uh, oh, two days later, I was late coming home and I went over in the pitch dark and I walked into that yard, turned the light on and that horse walked straight up to me. <laughs> it, yeah. yeah, he just walked straight to me. I didn't say anything. I had the light turned on. It was dark. I went straight down to his tendons and uh, they, there was no soreness in there, none whatsoever. I, I'd given him one treatment, somebody who didn't have a clue what they were doing. And so uh, I run it over him again, looked him about three or four days later. He was fine and he, he never, ever looked as if he was, he was having any trouble. But going, going back to before, before Brian left, there was another thing I, I forgot to, that when he went to uh, to Brisbane, he set up big uh, uh, human clinics but he also worked for the racing industry and he'd done a lot of work lecturing uh, with with the with trainers and and uh, people actually worked in stables down there uh, at, a, at a place uh, uh, just outside of Brisbane one, one of the big training tracks so uh, he was uh, a lot of people have got to know him through that area but uh, he certainly uh, it, it was just unfortunate that he wasn't there longer because I think it would have would have made one one big difference. But uh, but he he, he certainly he, he certainly done an awful lot for a, a lot of people. And uh, and the thing is, if you talk to anybody that was involved with Brian in those early days, uh, and can tell you just yeah, look, people with diabetes and all these sorts of things could just tell how much he done for them. Yeah. So. You've known Brian until he died, of course, until 2016. So you've known him for 23 years. You've had, you have known photonic therapy for at least 20 years or even longer. Yep. Now, and you're still using it today. You are also selling torches and so on. What is your big why that you have been using and are still using photonic therapy? Because of course, Photonic therapy, the McLaren method, it's not just red light therapy, it's red light therapy plus 
stimulation of specific acupuncture points. So we're doing a lot more than anybody else who is doing r just red light therapy. But for you, after all these years, what's your big why? Why are you still using it? Why are you so happy with it? What's your why? Well, I, I've got a diploma in acupuncture with, with for equine with, with needle as well, but that was only done because in, in acupuncture, they actually look at things a lot different to, to we actually look at. Brian looks at things. And, you know, uh, and, and a lot of the things that they talk about, um, it's very hard to get people to actually listen to you. But Brian has got it down to pat, and I, and I think it is it, it is fine. But if you, if you go back, I had a very, very fortunate start, like it was just that, that story I talked about, spoke about that horse. And, and I had been involved with Brian and knowing Brian of what he's done in the in his human clinics. So that's all started. And because I have, I've had major problems with my knees. Uh, I've had major problems with my elbows, all from playing football, falling off horses and working on the land and also running a feed mill, carting some very heavy loads. And if I never had it, I'm 78 now or close to 78. I would not be walking, I can guarantee you, if I never had this. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's going to give me a new knee or going to give me a new anything. But what it does, what I can't seem to get through to a lot of people, is the fact is it gets the body to restore itself. It's the body that does the work. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, how I look at a torch, it's a starter motor. And that's basically, if you took the starter motor out of the car, you're not going to go anywhere. You can have an old bomb if it's got a starter motor, you get somewhere. And I know that's very basic, but the fact of the matter is a lot of people don't start to understand it until you get to that sort of thing. So my situation, irrespective of what I'm doing for other people, and, uh, you know, like I'm, I've had amazing, amazing results with dogs that have massive sacroiliac problems. And I had one, I've got one coming tomorrow. Uh, when the pe friends of his, it was a what, poodle something cross, or, you know, it looks like a poodle doodle or something or other. Anyway, I touched it and I said, look, that dog just doesn't seem, oh, no, this only you know, lives at home, does this, and it's not very old. And his, it's sacriatic and its, and it's um, hips were so bad, it wanted a bite you. And yet nobody ever seen it. Now, and this is unfortunate that uh, people can't see these things, but even, I've got videos on there of treating a dog with the very same thing. And the results we have been got have been amazing. And they, and they, and they stay there for a long time, fortunately, mm -hmm. but there is, there's nothing that I can see a lot. My daughter's a very well-known doctor in Western Australia. She's on the board of so many things all the rest of it. Uh, so I, I'm tied up in the medical world as well with that. Uh, and she, although she doesn't use it in her clinic, and she's got six permanent doctors in her clinic, she doesn't use it in there, but they've, they've got one at home. The son, the brother-in-law's got one, the two brother-in-laws have got them at home. So they know what it can do. And the one, the one brother-in-law, he was actually the major testing pilot in, in, in the Indian Army. He's an uh, in Anglo-Indian. And he's had so much trouble with his ankles for so long, for years. And he rang me up and asked me what I thought. And he bought a torch. And he said that was the best day of his life and actually that he got that. That's what he's been able to do. So the torch to me, photonic therapy to me is a wow factor. And it can do things that <laughs> that nothing else can do. Well, the body does things that nothing else can, but it's just that this gets it all going. And, uh, and, and I don't think, uh, you know, and I've looked at lots of different things out there uh, over the years. I'm always looking. doesn't matter what it is. I'm always looking. And uh, there's absolutely, it uh, doesn't matter what they're doing. You've, you've still got to go from the skin to the collagen and set up the brain. You can do deep tissue. You can do whatever you want to do. It, it still comes back to that one very thing. As Terry said before, that on these other, on the other, there was I think it was on the second episode you had about how it works with the with the uh, with the collagen, and and but it's t that's a little simple for some people, but that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for this first part, Trevor. 
Terry, Dr. Terry, let's um, get back into time for you to when you met Dr. Brian McLaren. So Brian was invited to go over to the United States, which he did, as, as we've heard before. Um, Dr. Terry, how did you meet Brian? How, how did it all come along? Well, I would like to say that it was a very noble motive on my part, but it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, he, he uh, <clears throat> excuse me, he uh, sponsored a Central Oklahoma Veterinary Medical Association meeting, or COVMA, for easier, and, uh, you know, a free meal and an hour of continuing education, and, you know, you had me at the free meal, so <laughs> that, that was my motive. It was not very pure, but he, uh, he made a presentation, and I had one of my helpers had come with me, and what he was talking about, the things he was able to accomplish were things that I, let's just say at that time, I was very skeptical. Um, I thought, well, that's crazy. Nobody can do that with just that light. But the more he talked, I, I thought, well, you know, if that's really, if he can really do all that, then I'm really missing the boat if I can't learn how to do that myself and incorporate it into my own practice. And so that was on a Tuesday and I take Thursday afternoons off. And so I, I invited him uh, to come to the clinic that uh, next Thursday afternoon. And we spent the whole afternoon talking and he demonstrated the light. And then I bought one and I thought, oh my, what did I do? That was a stupid impulsive buy. I shouldn't have done it. My wife's gonna kill me. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, you know, the very next day I had a surgery that's typically very bloody. And again, like Trevor was saying, I, I didn't, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't very experienced at that time at all, but the, the, the bleeding was virtually zero. Uh, and normally it, it's a very bloody surgery. And I thought, holy cow, I've got to learn how to do this. So that was, that was how it all got started. And uh, what kind of impact did he have on you personally uh, and then professionally later on? Well, personally, um, you know, I, it, it was it made a profound impact because to to pick up your life and to move halfway around the world and to be in a new country and and trying to introduce something that you know is is looked at with a lot of skepticism um you know i had a lot a lot of admiration you know <laughs> a lot of people are described as leading lives of quiet desperation uh because they always wanted to do something and they never did it well you know brian Dr. Ther uh, McLaren, he did it, you know, he, he picked up and moved and really tried to expand his horizons. And, and, uh, you know, what a, what an example of, you know, having a goal and working very hard to, to try to achieve that goal. And, and I know, you know, he's always an extremely upbeat, uh, person and everybody, uh, loved him. I, it, it was funny because of course, with the Australian accent, um, at uh, church one day, the, the, they had a movie and, uh, the pastor showed a clip of it and he said, well, you'll know who Jesus is because he has a British accent. And I thought, you know, when you go all you're talking, Brian, you know, people must think you're Jesus. That's why they like you so much. I don't know, but he, uh, he was a very engaging uh, person. And, and I know one time he was talking, I think he was a little homesick, uh, for Queensland. And he said, you know, it, it kind of bothers me sometimes when I look out in here in Oklahoma and I don't know what kind of grass it is. I can't identify the birds, uh, you know, the, the animals and the, the trees and the bushes. And he said, it, I, I feel like a, you know, a real foreigner. And, and he said, it's very difficult uh, at times. Uh, and that was the only time, but, you know, it just helped me to understand, you know, what a, a sacrifice that he, he was making to do that. And I know, um, Australia's loss was our gain. <laughs> Sorry about that, Trevor. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it was an awesome time. And then professionally, it was a huge step for me because, again, I, I've talked with other holistic veterinarians, and it takes about 15 years of practice uh, for you to kind of have an epiphany of you know, again, leading a professional life of quiet desperation. Do I keep doing what's considered the standard of care and not really helping the animals as much as you'd like? Or do you just try to step out in faith and, and try to try to repair the original problem or at least uh, get it under control, something that you can and the pet can live with? And uh, 
it was a huge stepping stone for me to, to help make that decision. It's like, look, I'm going to step out and, and try to uh, expand my horizons and, uh, you know, just, you know, embrace the, the holistic, uh, you know, I think I've told you before about the horse. I was only out of vet school about a year and it was lame and I was called out to do a lameness exam. And I did a really nice lameness exam, what I was taught. And the, the farmer looked at me and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, we're going to put him on view, you know, kind of mute his own for, you know, 10 days and rest him for six weeks and he'll be okay. And he kind of puts his hands on his hips and says, why well, loud you're going to fix him, not just mask the symptoms. How many horses you fix by just masking symptoms? And it was like, wow. I said, well, I, you know, I just graduated. That's what I was taught to do. And that's what I can do. And he said, well, that's all the better you can do. Then let's go ahead and do it. And of course the horse did get better. But now as Trevor says, we could have probably, I could have probably got him better that day and got him, got him well on the way without giving the, the NSAIDs, which I prefer not to use at all because of their side effects. Yeah. But yeah, it was a, it was a huge step for me. Mm -hmm. But there, there you see, we can only do what we can do where we know to do. And, and that's why it's also so important to spread the message about uh, photonic therapy, about the McLaren method, so that more vets and more people would know this exists and that more people and animals can be helped. Because too many animals are still killed or put to sleep today because either they can't pay the, the vets, they can't pay the operation, or there is simply no medication that is taking their pain away. Or the medication that you can give has a lot of side effects, making it often even worse. So that's the good thing uh, about photonic therapy, because everybody can do that themselves at home. Now, I remember, uh, if I remember well, you wrote, well, of course I remember well, let's be honest, I have the copy. But my question was, uh, you wrote a long article together with Dr. Brian McLaren uh, about photonic therapy in veterinary medicine. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, it, he he talked to me about that, and so we we collaborated on that. And uh, it it was uh, for the International Society of Optical Engineering. It was in San Francisco, and uh, uh, we, neither one of us was able to go, but the paper was presented there and is in their archives. And basically, we were just trying to explain our our theory of of how the photonic therapy and thus acupuncture works, because when you when you look at the literature, nobody can really, uh, there's not one accepted uh, understanding of how acupuncture works. You know, like at Colorado State University, they'll say they do teach acupuncture there now. And they'll say, well, you know, if you put the needle in, uh, do you put it in a little bit, a long ways? Do you twist it to the right to get one effect, twist it to the left to get one effect? And, you know, all these uh, things. And, uh, you know, we were just trying to, uh, you know, explain. And then I had, I think, seven or eight clinical cases as to how I was able to use it. And, and again, things, you know, the dog hit by the car that's got the bleeding and the swelling in the brain, you know, your hands are basically tied in Western medicine. You know, you give him a bunch of fluids, pressure goes up, he dies, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can do something, but it, it's a very frustrating, but yet, you know, you have a modality where you can actually address the, the problem and, and treat it. So yeah, that, that's what it was all about. Yeah. Well, the sad thing was, of course, is that Brian, after a few years in America, uh, and we're not going to get into the details of what happened in America, it's the past and let's uh, uh, let the past sleep, I was going to say. But once Brian left the United States to go back to Australia, how did you continue? Are you still using for therapy? Oh yes, uh, yeah. I was I was really sad when he left. Of course, I realize you you have to go back home. I understand, uh, but yeah, I I use it literally every day in my practice. Uh, you know, I have uh, uh, I wouldn't dream of doing a surgery without it. You can't imagine how much better the pets do uh, when I treat them. And and in my ignorance, uh, I didn't know that uh, uh, Dr. McLaren told me, he said, well, how are you actually doing it? And I said, well, I, I get them pre-anesthetized and, and I do it. And he says, oh, come on, mate, you know, don't work on sedated animals. And I said, well, nobody told me that, so, <laughs> but it does work. And he says, oh, good to know. <laughs> so anyway, it's just part of my protocol and I've timed myself. It takes about three minutes. It adds three minutes to the uh, procedure, but I treat them before and then 
uh, do the surgery. And then immediately uh, when the tech is cleaning everything up, uh, they'll treat the scar immediately right away and then repeat the bleeding points. And if I need to, the wake up points. But what that does then is that most veterinarians, even for routine surgeries, will have to use some pain medications, which again is the NSAIDs uh, and Elizabethan collars. And I routinely don't have to use any of those uh, because the pets typically leave the, the incision alone. They usually don't chew at it. Of course, if you do and they have to wear an e-collar, but it, it really is. And then, you know, when I remove the sutures in 10 days, it looks like I did it three or four weeks prior. You know, they're completely healed and they look extremely uh, good. And people are, if they've had surgeries done elsewhere, they're really, really amazed at, at how well they do. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, there, and then I use it for anything from, you know, torn ACLs to intervertebral disc disease, so hit by cars to uh, degenerative myelopathy, arthritis, you know, you name it, you know, uh, it, it's, I will, I'll try it on just about anything, absolutely. And you're just now talking about the fact that you're using it in your practice every single day. But if I remember well, you once told me also a story that uh, you were using it outside the office within um, in a therapeutic writing center. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, um, I uh, through I guess I got started through a client, but there was uh, it was actually two different therapeutic writing programs. Well, the first one was Sunset Therapeutic Writing Program, and the second one was Savannah Station Therapeutic Writing Program, and I volunteered to, to treat their horses, and they had, uh, the horses were old, broken down rodeo horses. They were from 16 to 28 years old, and a lot of them uh, were not doing too well, and, you know, they, when you're riding special needs children, you know, you can't have a horse that's going to stumble and, you know, hurt the child. Uh, and so I was a, I treated the horses quite aggressively. Um, that was where most of my Sunday afternoons went and, uh, we got the horses that they had given up on and we got them to where they could safely ride the kids. And, and I, I volunteered for about, uh, six years and they were, uh, it got to be quite a bit of time. So I, I backed off for about three years now, but I've thought about giving them a call and maybe starting up again, but yeah, you, you never know what you're going to do because because it was such a it had such an impact on me seeing how the children, you know, responded to the horses. And I felt to, such a good part of it to be able to help the horses, help the kids. Uh, I even wrote a song about it. It's called Walk on CC. Uh, CC Lasso was my favorite horse. Uh, you're not supposed to have favorites, just like kids. Yeah. But he was my favorite. Um, and uh uh, walk on is the term they teach the kids to get the horse to go when they say walk on. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, it, I, I uh, did the lyrics. Uh, a friend of mine, I, he has a country western band. I asked him, could you write some music and sing it for me? And then we ended up going to Nashville and it got recorded there and uh, it turned out really well. If I am saying I, I really I still it gives me chills to hear it. And uh, the, the, at the one of the uh, programs even uh our, our producer was Dean Miller, Roger Miller's son, and he uh, they raised the money to do a music video, and that's on YouTube. If you look under uh, Sunset Therapeutic Writing Program, uh, you can you can see that on YouTube. But it, it was really it was a, a fascinating time and a good a good way to help get the word out about photonic therapy. Yeah, I'll I'll look up the link and I'll put the link here under this live video so everybody can go and have a look at it and listen to it, of course. Now, finally, so that everybody do understand wh what we are talking about here is that so you started out as uh, a normal, a regular vet, okay, and you are now a holistic vet for the last twenty years or 20 or 22 years or something, and you have been using now photonic therapy for 20 years. What are you going to do to me if I am taking all your torches away tomorrow? <laughs> uh, it can't be repeated publicly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, and, well, my, my wife would say she's from Texas. She'd say, well, I'd cloud up and rain all over you. <laughs> Uh, thank God I did not understand that, but it's okay. No, uh, to be honest, I would not be able to live myself without my, my torches. I have even several of them lying around here. So I always have a torch because 
that's also the trick. If you use it immediately, just like uh, Dr. Terry just said, he would torch the dog or the pet before the operation and then straight after the operation, it's, that's also the trick. The quicker you intervene, the quicker the, the, the pet will heal up. So, uh, and, and that's also with Trevor, his ankle, if he would have used the, the torch, if he would have the torch at that time uh, before, um, with Dr. Brian McClam, before he fell, if he would have used that torch immediately on his ankle, it would have healed up a lot quicker than when you're starting it later. But even if it's later, even if it's chronic, you can still use the same therapy, okay? And the healing will take place. It will just take a little longer uh, for the healing process uh, to be to be finished, let's say so. Now, for Trevor, anybody who wants to come into contact with Trevor, he has a website. But I will also put the links in here on the page. That's uh, woosenphotonictherapy.com. Trevor is also selling books and and torches, his own torches. Um, and Dr. Terry, I will also put his link on. He has a holistic vet clinic in Mustang, Oklahoma. And I'll put the details in so you can contact these people yourself if you would like to do so. Now, last question to both of you. Tell us a story about Brian. We love, we love to hear stories. Oh, go well, ahead, Trevor. <laughs> well, uh, uh, there's quite a quite a few stories out there, but the one that I, I think it's worth repeating, uh, which it goes back to Brian when he he had uh, his clinics started the human clinics in the local town because uh, it it got around that if the doctor couldn't fix you or you're still running into problems, you'd uh, they send you to the vet. We you know, it was quite funny, really, lots of ways, but there was. And this was is very serious, you know. And I think, you know, really, I mean, I thought about it thousands of times. And there was other different ones, but this is one that uh, a lady had brought her child, which is a baby, and I, I can't remember quite just how old it was. But took it to Brian and uh, said, "Look, they, uh, if this operation that they want to give it doesn't work, they're gonna this child's gonna have to have a colostomy bag because it was, it, it was just not able to move any motion, so it was in terrible pain." And they said, what can you do? So Brian, <laughs> being honest enough in himself, in, in his own mind, he says, oh, buggy to find those sort of thing. But anyway, he's he done what he needed to do. And that lady went home with that child and rang back half hour later. He thought, oh, my God, fathers, what's happened now? When she knew she's on the phone. And she says, Dr. McLaren, the, and he says, oh, yeah, what, what, what's wrong? She says, is nothing wrong? She says, but the baby is pooing like a wood duck, and uh, and that that child never ever had to have that operation. And Brian treated another couple of times, but just to make sure everything was right. And and look, I don't know where and what that child is now, which because it goes back quite a few years, of course. Uh, but that sort of thing, uh, it, it, you know, like general medicine couldn't help but if you try to tell that to to a lot of the to medicos they would just look at you and think you you know like you're having them on and and he had another one there that the the uh, a young kid had pulled the uh, uh, boiling pot of water over itself uh, in the uh, you know off the stove or something or other and uh, and they raced it down to him and and he treated it with a torch and and that uh, you know weeks later or months later there was absolutely no sign of all those uh, yeah all those places it was burned that that child had and uh, so really that's those are the things that i know it happened and i saw him there one day when i was at the clinic a lady came it was when he had the ostrich there actually uh, the ostriches because they have most problems of you know getting too much weight on them then they were splayed out them but uh, them them I know now from what the other products that we sell it was it's a major thing you know they sell that they're lacking calcium but it's not lacking calcium that's the the chelates we we sell chelate calcium which actually um, uh, it, it it helps the whole body utilize the calcium instead of it being tied up and instead of have calcification it sort of cleans them up but uh, but he had a lady come in and she was covered in, in cancer, uh, you know, all over it. Yeah. And it was very sad. And, and people like this were coming to him. Now I know 
the things were too advanced for that lady. Uh, but people were looking at Brian for, for so many things and so many problems. But but the thing I, I would say too, that which a, a lot of people don't understand or, or don't understand, but they, they don't get to grips with that the biggest significant act, um, asset this has got besides a torch is the fact of the assessment programs he has with, with horses. We can actually do things and and the horse, if, if we're prepared to listen to the horse, it's amazing what it can tell us. Now, there's a lot of people get in there with uh, the magnetic boots and all these things, and I leave them on, which I think is wrong anyway, but they do all these other things, but they they still have not got a, a handle on what's actually wrong. Like I've got what I call a comfort program. So, and I think, and I try to tell people with the horses that whatever you do, write it down. Every time you're with your horse, write it down exactly what's what you think. Doesn't matter about being wrong. Just write it down what you actually observe. Well, I've got a, a, a comfort program that I give it a a, a one, which is you know like nothing very much. If, if it's anything I think a bit wrong, or a two. If I think it's starting to get a, a bit that way, and it, or a three if it's uh, if it's if, it, if it's bad, uh, so it means that the end of the when you've done the, or the assessment, I, I, I bring them home and I put them through the computer, so it gives them all up colours and the where the what meridian it was and what it may be and all the rest of it, because it allows you to sit down and analyse the thing that much better. And when somebody has has got an animal that they're not real sure about things. But if you can tell the vet, the vet has got much more chance of doing a lot more work for you if you can tell them all these background of what's happening. So, and but with it doesn't matter who it is within the with the assessment. And I and I give a lot of people here what I call their probe, uh, and I have them made here, and, and I go through it with them because I because Australia is so big. I actually have people that we we actually work with them with their iPhone. And so they've got the. I could, they could be, like Perth is three thousand six hundred kilometres away from us, so they can be over there, and putting that on there and, and come in. It, and I can sit here in the office, and at least we could we could can't get a full not like we're being there, but at least it gives us some idea. They've got the gear there to do it with. So I don't think there's anything out there that could, that actually even's got even has got the slightest. Uh, uh, comparison with what what this system that brian's worked out has it's absolute i mean to say the more and more you talk about it, and even talking about it now and, and being able to talk yeah, you know, with terry there it actually helps me personally to think that right oh it's not, i'm not on my own we've got other people and i think this is something that we need to be doing a lot a lot more of we need to have more in, interaction uh, uh because a lot of people out there they don't want to be wrong well, by gum, I'm wrong every time I turn around, but I learn something because of it. And I think this is this is something that we've got to do educational wise a lot for ourselves anyway. And that and can be arranged. That's no that's, problem. That's that's what we need. Look, when you get when you get seventy eight, you can't go racing around like you used to race around. You can't jump fences, but by gum, you can do an awful lot with this system. Absolutely. An awful lot. Yeah. Thank you, anyway. Trevor. Thank you. Dr. Terry? Well, I, you know, just reflecting on everything, I, I think one of the big things I came away from Dr. McLaren is he, he taught me to think uh, of thing of the human and the pet processes in terms of electrophysiology. Why is the blood clotting? Why is the blood not clotting? Why is this healing? What is this not healing? You know, and, and one of the uh, I had actually, he, I, I think, arranged it. Uh, I actually lectured at the International Veterinary uh, Acupuncture Society one time, and one of the attendees there uh, was. He heard me tell about how quickly the, you know, my, uh, you know, the surgeries would heal up, and he was saying that he called me up later, about a year later, and he said, "Oh, you know, I have to leave the sutures in for." Uh, you know, three weeks, uh, it comes apart. If I take the sutures out sooner, what am I doing wrong? And I said, well, are you, are you giving them, uh, you know, one of the NSAIDs uh, for post-op pain relief? And he said, how did you know? <laughs> and <laughs> thanks to Dr. McLaren, I said, well, if you just had surgery, would you willingly and knowingly take something that made your blood not clot and made your wound not heal? I said, that's what the NSAID is doing. 
oh my. <laughs> so I told him, I said, get a red light, get a torch. And, you know, you can use the tramadol if you wish. It's a mu agonist. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, and then I didn't hear anything. I, ca I called him up a month later and I said, well, how are your surgeries looking? And he said, oh, they're doing great. Just like you said. Um, so I, I think that was one of the biggest things. And, and uh, I'd had an unfortunate a ch health challenge about five years ago, I had a virus attack my heart and put me into dilative cardiomyopathy and congestive heart failure. And uh, I almost died. My ejection fraction was five to 10, uh, which is not compatible with life. And, uh, you know, I did take some of the Western medicine, but, um, you know, I ended up uh, talking with uh, Brian over the phone and uh, he said, oh, no worries, mate. <laughs> he'd, he'd treated somebody near Perth with that. And he said, we'll get you back. Not a problem. And so, you know, through everything that was done, uh, now it's five years later, I'm still alive. Uh, my ejection fraction is up to 50 and I, I work full time. I go to the gym six days a week. Uh, I walk at least three and a half miles on the treadmill every day. So sometimes more. And then I try to lift weights three or four times a week. And, you know, I just, the you know, because at that point, they're basically telling you, you're going to die or need a transplant or something like that. And, uh, you know, Dr. McLaren's like, oh, no worries, mate, you'll be right as right. <laughs> and so we, uh, uh, you know, it, thank, I'm just, you know, forever grateful. And, you know, the uh, I, I, I could listen to him tell stories forever. It, it was just so, so interesting. He, uh, uh, I think one time he, he told me, I, I don't, know exactly where he was if it was in Queensland but he had uh, uh, went over to talk to a couple of the fathers at this uh, monastery and uh, after about two or three bottles of wine he ended up buying the monastery <laughs> and he came <laughs> home told, told Lita he says I bought it you did what <laughs> but, but he uh, uh, she said actually it was one of the nicest places I lived I guess it was ancient it had three foot walls she said it was always nice and cool even yeah. during the heat of the summer and uh, uh, he just and, and then here are his stories about growing up on the on the uh, uh, where he grew up in, in Queensland, the, the stories with his neighbors and and, uh, you know, like the uh, w when they lived at the Abbey, he said that unfortunately there was a pub nearby and people would relieve themselves after a night of partying. And he thought, well, you know, even though it's not a monastery anymore, they shouldn't be doing that. So he cut a bunch of pieces of, of uh, black pipe, uh, plastic pipe. And I think, and I don't know if he put them on strings or how he did it, but when the crowd after the pub shut down, they were all out there relieving themselves. He stepped out and said, Oh, look out for the do guys, mate. There's a whole herd of them. And he, <laughs> he pushed those plastic pipes and they thought it was a bunch of the do guy snakes. And he said, That took care of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he, boy. Oh, boy. What do we miss him? <laughs> Isn't it? We all miss him very dearly. Yes. Well, I want to thank you, both of you, from the bottom of my heart. And also because this is this was not an easy session to organize. But Trevor, it's now almost 11 p.m. And we started this. And for Dr. Terry, it was 6 a.m. On a Sunday, Dr. Terry is here at 6 a.m. to be on this call to be uh, in this interview. So I am really grateful to both of them for being here. But this is what happens. I mean, Trevor is in Australia, Dr. Terry is in the United States and I'm in Europe. But you see, we are represented in every part of the world. And it's good to come together and I'm, I will make sure that we do that in future too. Um, but we are going to have one more interview Next week or the week after, we will see that we can organize it so that Rob McLaren can be here too. And during that interview, it's going to be the last part. It's going to be the part from uh, end of 2008, 2009 till now. Okay. So uh, everybody here present will be welcome there too. So we can talk a bit more. But that's a bit what we're going to do. And then in that last one, I will be talking also a bit more myself because that's my 10 years of time frame. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I will make sure to put the links in here later on today. So don't worry about that. And 
I hope to see you again next time. Leave a comment, like this, and share this with your friends. If you like this inf interview, it's always good that people know about Dr. Byron McLaren and his phototherapy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eva. And thanks, Terry. We'll have to catch up again sometime. Sounds I, I, great. I've got...